Hey guys, Shane here. So in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at making finite bases or diorama bases, totally from scratch using some very basic materials. So here's the finished piece, and we're going to take you through on how I made this. If you're curious how I painted up the Fulcher Maker, a link to that video will come up on your top right now. So first things first, I'm already marking out and squaring out the balsa wood, what's going to make up the base of our piece. So I'm just using a set square or a T square to make sure my uh, lines are square. Since it's a finite base, I don't need it too wide, about 80 centimeters wide square will do. So using a fresh blade on my scample, I'm uh, now squaring the pieces. Balsa wood will cut pretty easy, however try not to do it in one cut, one will, several scores will do the job. Areas that are against the grain, or the cutting surface is small, I use a razor saw. If you try to cut this with a hobby knife, you will run the risk of actually tearing the balsa wood, as it is quite brittle. And once I'm happy with my cuts, I'm just going to use a simple sanding stick and give them a quick polish, just to clean off any burrs or rough edges. Now I'm going to start marking out the edges of my base. Again just using some balsa wood and I'm actually using the base that we just cut out as my template to ensure that each side matches up. And also I key them to ensure that each side will match up. And once again using my T-square and a straight edge I begin to cut my pieces to length. Now I will cut my or mark my uh, edges a little bit longer than they need to be just in case I botched the cut, which sometimes with me is not, which is a, a true possibility. And again, if the uh, balsa wood isn't cut on your first go, just try again. And it's exactly the same process for every side of the base, just marking them and cutting them as we go. For the actual groundwork for our base, we're going to be using some blue uh, insulation foam. And I'm just using, once again, a razor saw to cut this. And then using the base again, just to make sure everything is uh, the correct size. At least this way you know if you use the actual physical base to mark out the dimensions that it will fit. However, it's a good idea to keep rechecking and dry fitting everything to ensure that you get a good fit before you glue anything in place. Now I'm just using some Gorilla Glue to glue the base together. Uh, balsa wood will take super glue pretty well, especially uh, a good brand like Gorilla Glue, it will be more than adequate. I'm also using a bit of Gorilla Glue inside the, the joints to reinforce them. Now we're going to start marking out the wall piece for our finette. And again, I'm not trying to cut the blue foam in one cut, just a few um, pretty firm cuts will do it. I do dig in a bit too deep here, as you can see that it's actually uh, resisting my cuts at first and then I ease back the pressure. Again, I do a quick test fit, make sure everything fits together. And I also position the wall to see how I want to uh, place it before I glue it in place. Once I'm happy, I cut a 45 degree chamfer into one of the corners of the, the wall section. And I also put about a 50 degree chamfer on the top of the wall, which I'll explain later in the video. Then I mark out its position where I want it at a slight angle. Again, I try to avoid straight lines. And now we're going to mark the actual brickwork on the wall section. And for this, I'm just using a steel ruler and a ball tip pen or a ball pen. Don't use any other type of uh, cut, um, marking implements. The ball tip will actually do the job just fine. And you'll see I'm about giving each set of bricks about a five, uh, five millimeter gap. However, you can mark these out or do it by eye, depending on how you want to do it. And I'm applying pretty even pressure, not enough to cut too deep into the foam, but just enough to break the surface tension. And again, just give it a few firm swipes of your pen and you'll dig into it. Now I'm just doing the edges of the wall. I'm gonna be leaving one side of the wall blank 
as that's meant to kind of go off into infinity as it were, which we'll see in a few minutes. Now we're going to start marking in the actual bricks again using our pen. And you can see I'm just slowly digging in with the, the, the biro. I'm not putting too much pressure on my pen to do this. I don't want to damage the foam. So I'm just applying a small amount of force and just letting the, the, the pen sink into the, the foam. And also don't worry about using a, uh, an ink pen. It's not going to show through in any of the paint you're using. And I would recommend you when you start laying your brick pattern, start on the edge and work your way out and just do the entire edge first and then start doing the, the the lines. That's a much easier way of doing it. After a few minutes you begin to develop uh, a routine or a, a rhythm for doing this and they come together very quickly. So if you remember I cut or I mentioned I cut a 50 degree angle or chamfer onto the top of the wall and these are going to be our capstones. To add a little bit of interest, now I'm going to damage some of the bricks. So I'm just going to use the tip of my uh, hobby knife and I'm just going to start picking into it. As you can see, not a lot of pressure is needed and it begins to react immediately. This is a great way of, great way of doing battle damage. I also pop out a few bricks by just literally uh, sliding in the blade behind it and popping them out. And I also take out a broader big chunk of wall by just holding my blade at an angle to simulate it being hit by a machine gun fire. So to glue our blue foam to our base, we can't use any type of solvent or it'll melt the blue foam. So for this way I'm just using No More Nails, which is a, a non-solvent based adhesive. Uh, wood glue or polymer's glue would work very uh, good for this, t very well for this too. However, ensure that you push down pretty hard on your base to ensure that they stick correctly. Now I'm actually marking out where the guide horns or the guide rods for the wall section are going to go. And I've just glued, using no more nails, two paper clips into the base of my wall section just to reinforce it and stop it from being knocked loose, as you can see here. Now I'm just going to apply a rather uh, generous dollop of no more nails, spread it around. And I do want it to expand out from each side of the wall section as you can see here. And then I'm going to blend that back with a piece of scrap, uh, scrap balsa wood. Since I have a little bit of blue foam left, I'm actually going to make some uh, loose brick, brick sections. So I'm just going to cut a few mil into a small strip like this. And I'm just going to cut them in some random brick shapes. It's a very easy way to create a lot of bricks. It's a bit tedious and time intensive. However, you can get some pretty um, realistic effects. To secure them onto the base, I'm just going to apply a rather generous amount of white glue. I haven't tinned this in any way, I'm just applying it straight out of the bottle. And I'm, as you can see, I'm applying it very thick. I want to ensure that the loose bricks sit and sink right into the glue. I don't want these coming loose later. Once we're happy with that, I'm going to apply a bit of loose sand just to simulate a bit of masonry and dust. And it will add a very nice effect once that dries. You can also, once this is dry 24 hours later, apply a watered down solution of white glue just to lock it all in place. Now we're going to start working on painting the wall section. I've allowed 24 hours for my No More Nails to dry, and now I'm playing a priming coat of Panzer Grey from Filejo. It's a good idea to start with a darker colour to ensure that we hide all the blue. And as you can see, the pen marks immediately disappear under a coat of paint. They should not show through. Also make sure that we move the model around a lot to ensure that we get every angle 
and that we have no uh, of the blue form showing true. So now I'm going to start adding lighter shades of grey. So now I'm starting with dark, uh, dark sea grey. And I'm going to model this on. So I'm going to leave a lot of the Panzer grey in the recesses. And I'm just going to randomly model it on. And this is going to start building up into a very attractive stone wall of finish as we use progressively lighter shades of grey. Now I'm coming in with light grey. And again, I'm picking out certain sections of brick. I'm not trying to pick out individual bricks, but more so a column or a section of five or six bricks and just giving it a general light coat of the light grey, again from Vallejo. Now I'm highlighting some of the capstones. You'll also notice that I'll spray for a few minutes and I'll come back and spray again. That way I'm kind of considering do I want to add more colour or leave it alone. That's the best way to do this. Just spray for a few minutes and then take your time and see how much you like it. Best not to be too aggressive too soon. Now I'm coming in with a bit of light grey blue and I'm being more disciplined with the lighter colours and I'm just picking out a few bricks here and there. Once again coming back up onto the top and picking out it in the lighter colour as well not forgetting about the masonry at the base of the damaged wall. And as you can see as we're going lighter with the greys, immediately begins to pop, but the darker colours are still showing true, thus giving us a nice contrast. So by taking our time with the lighter colours, we can see we get a very nice transition. And by only spraying a small amount of paint, we, we get a really nice transition, so it's not too stark. We want this to be subtle. Now the final colour that I'm putting in is going to be Stone Grey, once again from Vallejo. And I'm going to only really put this into certain areas, so certain blocks are going to stand out. And this is going to add a lot of visual interest to the wall. We don't want to be too overpowering. We don't want to take away from the figure and from the equipment that we're going to put into the scene at the end. But just to note it, make it a little bit visually stimulating. I'm also going to focus the lighter colour around the fallen masonry, just to simulate dust buildup, as well as focusing the lighter colour into some of the battle damage, especially the chunk of missing wall. So now I'm beginning to pick out some of the more areas I want to highlight even more, maybe areas that have been bleached by the sun. So now the damaged pieces to stone are getting pretty light but pronounced layer of stone grey just to simulate a bit of damage, a bit of dust. 
and I'm also just coming in randomly and applying a very light coat here and there just to blend it all in together. I decided that it might be a good idea to paint in our base, so I'm just using a bit of Panzer Grey here. I had to happen to have it in my airbrush, and I was using a piece of cardboard to protect the wall. This could have been done at the very beginning of the build if you wished, and just simply mask your painted uh, base or stained base with a bit of masking tape. However, it's just as easy to do it now. Now I'm just painting in the tops of the, the base, make sure none of the wood is showing through. And again, being careful not to overspray on the wall. So once I've been given 24 hours to dry, I'm using just a little bit of masking tape uh, to seal and mask off the uh, base edges. So now I'm going to start making up our ground mixture using Plaster of Paris. So the base or the cup I'm using is just simply an espresso cup and I'll fill the bottom quarter of the cup with plaster. Then I'll add a large amount of white glue or PVA glue in and this is actually quite important that you, you add quite a bit into it and this will give it um, a bit adhere and um, will help it adhere to your piece better. To actually give it a ground uh, effect, I'm going to add some Burnt Umber Artist Paint, uh, acrylic paint directly in, and then I'm going to mix it up. The best thing to do is add your water bit by bit. We're going for like a porridge-like consistency, but it's best just to add small amounts of water at a time. So I'm just going to mix this quite thoroughly until I don't see any of the plaster anymore. And I'm also going to add water as I need it. So once I'm happy, I'll add, I'll just keep adding water until I'm happy to consistency. To add some texture to our plaster mix, I'm actually going to start adding a little bit of static grass into the mixture just to give it a little bit of fibres and help um, create the idea of roots and what have you in the ground. Just like before, I'm slowly building it up. I'm not going too crazy, just adding it in small amounts until I'm happy with the consistency. To further uh, give a better sense of ground texture, I'm adding a little bit of sand into the mix. However, be very disciplined with this. Don't add too much too soon. Again, I'm adding a little bit more sand. I'm not too happy with it. So again, I'm going to build up a, build up a bit more sand, mix it fully in. Bearing in mind, the more texture we put into it, the harder it's going to get to work. The harder it will be to work with. Because I don't want this to look like mud, I'm going to put a few drops of desert sand into this mix, or like a sand yellow, just to give it the idea of dried dirt. I don't want it to be too mud-like, as it's meant to be summer, and I don't want the seam to be too muddy. And again, I'm just going to mix that in quite thoroughly. So once you're happy with your mixture, it's important that we try to apply it in the one setting, just so it doesn't dry. So I'm going to apply this using an artist's trowel, or spatula. And I'm using the smallest one I have, so I have ultimate control. Now I'm applying this in pretty thick dollops. I'm not going to fill the base immediately with it, but I'm going to build it up somewhat thick, thickly, but in small sections at a time. And I'm also going to be careful to ensure that it's blended fully in with the base corners and with the edge of the wall section. I don't want any gaps.
This might look a little bit messy for some, however there is an advantage of using tinted plaster. And the reason for that is, if you glue a rock or a stone down or just chips in time, you won't have any of the white plaster showing underneath as the entire mixture is earth coloured. It's often a disadvantage of using things like air dry clay like DOS that you paint after the fact. If a stone or a tree or just chips with use or age, you will actually see the white clay underneath it and it can, it can be a little bit annoying having to go back in and fix it. Also, uh, plaster when mixed correctly will not crack or shrink. So that's a massive advantage in my eyes. Now I'm just taking the time just to blend it all together. I'm trying to take the trowel marks out of the ground just to make it look a little bit more believable. And once I'm happy, I'm just going to remove the excess from the corners and the top of the base. So with our groundwork done, I'm going to allow it to dry for 24 hours. Once fully dry, I'm going to airbrush some other earth tones over the original colour just to break it up a little bit. And for this I'm going to use some Fleo uh, Flat Earth. So we're going to start adding our static grass and grass tufts. So I'm going to begin with the grass tufts, which happen to be from Warlord Games, and these are their summer tufts. And I'm just going to apply these piece by bit by bit and slowly build it up. And this is going to go on before I start laying the static grass. The trick is not to put too many of them down in one go. Take your time, view your model um, from different angles and see uh, if it's too busy or not. I don't want this to be too overpowering or too busy. I'm also going to lay a couple of header tufts just to add a little bit of uh, colour. So now that I've allowed our grass tufts to dry for 24 hours, I've made up a watered down uh, mixture of PVA glue and I'm going to start applying that in preparation for the static grass. I'm not going to cover the entire base with static grass. I want some of the soil to show through just to add a little bit of visual interest and to get a more realistic effect. So with the PVA glue down, I'm going to start applying the static grass. In this case, I'm using autumn grass, and I'm applying it pretty thickly. I want to ensure that I get a pretty strong coat or heavy coat. So once I'm happy with static grass, I'll just turn the base upside down and I'm just going to tap a few times to get the excess off. And now I'm going to do on the other side again, just doing it in sections and applying thick amounts to each glued area just to ensure that I don't get a patchy finish. So there you have the groundwork done. It's very simple, but it does give a very convincing effect. So now I'm going to start applying the accessories to the scene to bring it all to life. So I'm just going to use some PVA glue, not watered down, straight out of the bottle, and I'm just simply going to glue it in place. However, do be careful where you apply the glue. We don't want to see any glue marks on the pieces. I have dry fitted all the, the components for the diorama or for the vignette on before I glue them, just so I can test fit them until I'm happy with the composition of the shot. And once I am, I'll just start applying them with some PVA glue and just using a tweezers to ensure that they're bedded down and adhered to the base.
And with that, our scenic base is finished. As you can see, it's a very simple and easy process. Please stay tuned for more tutorials that will be covering other base designs and figure painting videos in the future. I've been Shane, thank you so much for listening and watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Happy modeling, and watch out for those buses. Bye-bye.